Hi guys, Mr. Talbot here. For you. We're going to be diving into the topic 3.3. And in this topic, we're going to look at kind of four things that we often refer to as the Atlantic revolutions. Um, so four different countries going through different political revolutions, all with some enlightenment ideas attached. So that's going to be what's going on in England, United States, France, and Haiti. So make sure you're checking out your study guide, kind of knowing what you should be taking notes on as we go through this. I'll try and emphasize a few key points. Some things to keep an eye out for you um, as we see this. Uh, we're going to see the term constitution. Uh, we're not talking about just the American constitution. What a constitution is, is think of it as the rule book for the government. So these are written rules that the government follows, things it says that the government can do, things that the government can't do. If we think back to topic 3.1 where we had that absolutism, well, an absolute monarch is not going to have anything that's within a constitution because they don't want to put any limits on their powers. They don't want to have any rules. They want to be able to make them up as they go. A constitution is going to change that. So with that, with the constitution will come constitutional monarchies and republics. So the big difference between a constitutional monarchy and an absolute monarchy is that the monarch can't just do whatever they want. There's a sharing of power. Either they're sharing it um, or limiting themselves through the constitution, or they're limiting themselves by sharing it with the legislative branch, like we're going to see in England. Um, the other type of government that really kind of comes out of this time period is going to be a republic um, or republicanism. And so this is, you know, power being held by the people um, through elected representatives. Sometimes this is also called a representative democracy. Um, so you're still going to have, you know, a main leader like a president, for example, or a prime minister um, in, instead of a king or a queen. But then there's almost always going to be a legislative branch as well in there. And again, a sharing of power in one of the big ideas of thinkers like Montesquieu, that separation of powers, checks and balances, those kind of things. So let's kind of talk about how we got to this point in world history. Um, so remember, the Enlightenment kind of really kicks off in the mid 1600s to the through the 1700s. And the first country that's going to kind of become somewhat enlightened, um, as far as in you know Europe and the Americas, it's going to be England. Now they probably have the most limited revolution we're going to see before that we're going to study, but it's still a big power change. So. England has had a feudal system for a long time, um, coming out of, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire, you know, in, you know, the year 500 or so. Get to the year 1200, you don't need to take notes on this, but there's a thing called the Magna Carta where the king is going to decide to share power with the nobility. So England kind of becomes an oligarchy. Still, for everyday people, there's not a whole lot of power. Um, and a civil war breaks out between competing factions of the nobility and stuff. Interesting story. Not, not for this class, though. Um, fast forward a little bit more. I should say during the Civil Wars when Thomas Hobbes is going to write The Leviathan. Um, and this is his book about um, how the state of nature and when you have failed government, it's awful. And governments need to protect the people. And protection is the most important thing. Makes sense for a guy living in, during a Civil War. The revolution I want to take notes on here is called the Glorious or sometimes the Bloodless Revolution. Um, we're going to see it's not totally bloodless because it's going to inspire revolution in other places, but we're going to call it the Glorious Revolution. Um, so this kicks off. Uh, there's a lot of religious strife between Protestants and Catholics following the Reformation in England and Henry VIII. And fascinating story. Again, not for right now, though. A, there's a king already in England, and then there's another guy who's going to come over from the Netherlands, got some family ties parliament which really had very limited power the legislative body of england is going to side with this guy this dutch king um basically forces the english king to go into exile and parliament's like hey listen we just helped you take over the country um you're going to need to give us power and so parliament is going to um put a lot of restrictions on the monarch's power this is kind of leads england to becoming a constitutional monarchy again that sharing of power between the legislative branch parliament and the king the other limit on it is they're going to write a bill of rights um, which is you know part of a constitution it's part of setting a limit here are the things that the government can't do um, you've got to allow for regular parliaments and then over time parliament's going to continue getting more and more power um, that we see continued up to this day um, you have to have free elections in parliament freedom of speech notably you're not going to see freedom of religion that's going to be something that England does not have during this time period. Um, so after we get to this point of, you know, the glorious revolution, um, the English monarch is never going to have absolute power again. 
But some kings are going to try and take back more power. When they do, that's going to inspire revolutions in Ireland, and as you're aware, revolutions in the United States, uh, which is where we're going to head next. Um, so as we're looking at these next three religions, we're going to think about, you know, how did the spread of Enlightenment ideas influence these revolutions against the power structures that were already in place? Um, and we're going to see kind of with our friend over here, Toussaint, uh, he's going to be the leader of the Haitian Revolution. He's talking about that absolute principle that no man born red, black, or white can be the property of his fellow man. So that's very directly against slavery. Thomas Jefferson is going to talk about inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're going to see a similar thing in France. So what's going on at this time? Um, England, before and throughout, uh, after the Glorious Revolution, they become kind of the global superpower, along with Spain's powerful and France is going to be kind of spreading these empires. Um, Native American populations have pretty much been wiped out by this point, um, and we're entering into the early phases of industrialization, which means that um, your business people are going to want a little bit more freedom. They were going to want to move away from that mercantile system where if I'm a British colonist, I have to sell stuff to the British, even if it's at a lower price than what the French would give me. And if I'm going to buy a manufactured good, I got to buy it from Britain, even if I can get it cheaper from Spain. So you can see a, how a, someone, an entrepreneur is going to be really, really frustrated with the system. That's going to be part of what pushes for some of this change. Slavery is a big part of a lot of these economies at this time. Um, and we're going to see that throughout the United States still. We're definitely going to see it in Haiti. That's why Haiti's going to be overthrowing it. The Enlightenment is now taking hold. We've got thinkers like John Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, um, all coming on the scene around this time. Encouraging that idea of equality, liberty, natural rights, those things we've talked about in topic 3.2. Um, we've also got the science of the revolution at this time. Again, that push for progress, we're going to see. And the progress needs to also make better governments and make better countries. That's what we're going to see here. So the, we talk about the Americas here. We're talking about North and South America as well as the Caribbean. We're going to see these democratic ideals, democracy, voting, representative, people having power, um, are all going to be things that are going to be established in Latin America we're going to see in our next unit. We're going to see it in Haiti today, the United States, um, Mexico uh, coming soon. Um, the idea of government gets its power from the people. That's why our Constitution of the United States says we the people at the beginning, consent of the government. Um, we're going to see uh, as we move forward that a lot of these ideas the United States puts in place is going to be the inspiration for Latin America. It inspires Haiti. It's going to inspire um, what's going on in South America, led by Simone Bolivar. It's going to inspire the Mexican Revolution. Um, or sorry, I should say the Mexican War of Independence. Um, and it's going to lead to independent states across the Americas, both North and South America. This is not an American history class, but I do want to briefly touch on some of the stuff you know from the American Revolution situated in where it's at in world history. Um, so if you already have a lot of background information, don't feel like you need to take a ton of notes on this. Um, so we've got the Enlightenment ideals and the Declaration of Independence. Again, American politicians are trying to have more self-government, which the King of England was trying to take away. Um, they're going to win the Revolutionary War thanks to the help of the French. Uh, this puts France into more debt. We're going to see that's important here shortly. The United States is going to have a constitution that's going to limit and then a bill of rights that really limits the federal government, has separation of power, has checks and balances, civil liberties like freedom of speech, religion, assembly, and then a divide. All of these are enlightenment ideas that we see in the United States. There's been a little bit more time on the French Revolution. So France had the ultimate absolute monarch in King Louis. Um, he said, I am the state. And the way the old regime or the pre-revolutionary France was set up, the society was broken into three different classes or three different estates. You had the first state, which is the clergy. You're talking about half of a percent of the population. Then you've got your nobility, about one and a half percent of the population. And yet those people um, made all government choices for the most part and um, basically had to decide how to spend all the money. The big issue is that the third estate, which is everybody else, whether you're a peasant or a business person that's not noble, you paid all the taxes. And then you got to, you would see the king and queen, you know, wasting this money, living lavishly. 
You would see uh, the king deciding to get involved in wars with Britain, including to help the United States. And all of this is going to lead to, um, you know, a very unequal system. And so the French commoners and middle class are going to rise up, the bourgeois they're called, and they're going to um, have this revolution. The idea initially was that the king could disinstitute some reforms, kind of going for what went on in the Glorious Revolution, establish a constitutional monarchy. The middle class kind of gets upset about the slow pace of government change. Um, starvation gets worse and all sorts of issues. So the revolution is going to escalate. They're going to end up beheading the king. They're going to end up beheading the, the queen. Then they're going to behead a lot of people that they viewed as enemies of the republic or enemies of the revolution. And then the guy behind it, he gets beheaded again. Great stories. Not for right now, though. Um, but it really kind of gets out of control. And so an initial republic is formed, but it's not able to control the revolution. So it ends up, uh, France goes into, uh, ends up with a dictator named Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, now he's not, he's a, he becomes a dictator. He's not a monarch, but he's going to spread a lot of what are good ideas, like reforms in education and transportation. But he also spreads a lot of really bad ideas, including an increase in patriarchy. Um, but also um, a lot of these revolutionary ideas around the rest of Europe. So the final one we want to talk about is the Haitian Revolution. So Haiti was a French colony, which means it was ruled by King Louis and then ruled by Napoleon. Now, temporarily, um, the French Revolution is going to abolish slavery. It's like an initial rising up of the slaves. France agrees to abolish slavery. And the slaves are like, hey, you said that everyone's born with the idea of liberty. That's an enlightenment idea. Well, that applies to us, too. Napoleon's like, hey, this France, we need money. Haiti's our number one source of money through sugar plantation and sugar plantation is really hard work and it's most of the slaves working are going to die within 10 years of getting there. Um, so it's very much still an African population there because very few um, slaves were actually having kids because they were dying too soon. Um, so it's very much needs the system of slavery. Napoleon tries to reinstitute it. There's a big rising up and because of malaria, because of, um, Good, good leadership from Tucson Overture, among others. Long story short, Haiti ends, wins its independence, and it's the first country to abolish slavery. This is going to be a huge inspiration for the abolitionist movement in the United States, as well as places like Mexico we're going to see are going to abolish slavery much before the United States. Um, and uh, one downside is that the United States, among others, are really going to try to limit how inspi inspiring it could be, so they're going to just not deal with Haiti. They're not going to trade with Haiti. It's going to stifle their economy. It has led to um, issues to the modern day. France even forced Haiti to pay an independence debt, which would be billions of dollars, which really crippled their economy um, for a long time. So as we kind of are finishing up here, um, I want to wrap a few things up. Every one of these Enlightenment ideas um, was, or sorry, every revolution is inspired by the Enlightenment, limiting our power on monarchs or getting rid of the monarchs altogether. Um, Haiti's going to end slavery. That's later going to inspire other uh, abolition of slavery. Uh, and the middle class is kind of the, the business people lead the revolts in the U.S. and in France. It's the lowest class slaves in Haiti. Um, the United States is going to inspire Latin America. The United States was kind of inspired by the Glorious Revolution. Um, Haiti's going to help inspire some Latin America. And then France, of course, is going to spread the revolutionary ideas to Europe, but also inspired Haiti. So you can see this kind of big web of inspiration, big web of importance in world history.